It's a blessing to meet together again as a congregation. We, we extend a warm welcome to all guests and visitors worshiping with us this Lord's Day. The Council has only the following two announcements. The consistory hopes to meet the Lord willing tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. in the church building. And our offerings today are for the work of Middle East Reformed Fellowship. So far the announcements let us lift up our hearts to the Lord in worship. Congregation of the Lord, where does our help come from? Receive now the Lord's greeting. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Let us praise our God together by singing from Psalm 67, stanzas 1 and 3. Let us now together with the church of all times and places express that our God is king as we have just sung, but let us also sing the words of the Apostles' Creed as they are set to music in hymn 2 to express our Christian faith and confession.
Let us now go to our God in prayer and seek his blessing over our worship. Our heavenly God and Father, as we draw near to worship you this afternoon, as we could just sing of the words of our Christian confession of faith in you and in the work of your Son, Jesus Christ, that the Spirit has worked in our hearts, we are filled with thanksgiving and joy. Lord, it is almost unmanageable for us to truly understand all that you have done for us. For, for while we were yet your enemies, you loved us through your Son, Jesus Christ. While we had done nothing to earn or deserve your love, you sent your Son into this world to live and to die, only to rise again and ascend into heaven, to sit on heaven's throne so that we might be saved. Lord, we thank you that in this world of deep darkness you have shone the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for coming to us as your people in your infinite grace and compassion and love by revealing yourself to us in your word as our loving God and Father, the God of truth and the God of life, the overflowing fountain of all good. Father, whenever you give us opportunity to reflect upon our commitment to you, we come to see and understand again and again that our commitment to you would be nothing apart from your commitment to us. For while we are so fickle, you are so faithful. While we are so forgetful of our identity as your children, yet you never forget who you are, our Heavenly Father and our powerful Redeemer and Savior in Jesus Christ. Lord, sometimes we turn away, but you have never turned away from any one of your children. We live in a world of much uncertainty and of tremendous confusion politically, economically, morally, and spiritually. But Lord, in the midst of all of that, we have you, our rock and our refuge in times of trouble, our eternal and unchanging God. Father, we pray now for a blessing upon the reading of Scripture and of the preaching of the good news. Give us humble and hungry hearts. May we truly long for the spiritual nourishment of your word and may your word come to live deeply within us so that we may be able to see how your word is the source of our life and of our blessing for all who walk in your ways and who are faithful in doing your will. Father, we ask you to bless all of our sister churches in this country. We thank you for the presence of many other faithful Reformed churches spread out across this province and this country. We pray that you will bless the Federation of Canadian Reformed Churches, protect your churches from false doctrine and from division caused by sin, and protect them also from the moral corruption caused by worldly thinking and worldly living. And wherever improvement is necessary, Lord, we pray for ongoing reformation and also for the commitment we need to work towards that rejuvenation that we will undertake such work with great zeal and energy. We pray for a blessing, particularly upon the seminary of our churches where men are being prepared and trained for the work of ministry of the gospel. We pray that the seeds which are sown today may reap a rich harvest for your kingdom, that your church may grow and increase and expand all over this world as the gospel is proclaimed for the glory of your name and for the good of your people. And so we pray for a blessing upon your people wherever they meet this day, whether here or on the mission fields, and keep us all in your fatherly goodness and care. Father, hear us and bless us, for we pray all this 
In Christ's name alone. Amen. Let us join our hearts together in song by singing from Psalm 73, stanzas 1, 4, and 5. Psalm 73, where the psalmist looks around himself at the wealth of the ungodly. Let us sing the words of this psalm, Psalm 73. In connection with what the Church confesses in Lord's Day 42 of the Heidelberg Catechism, let us read from God's Word first and foremost from the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34, as well as verses 38 to 44. And it would be helpful to keep your Bibles open to this passage as we will be looking closely at the elements of Christ's teaching here in this chapter. So let us read from Mark 12, beginning at verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well, that is Christ answering his opponents, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? 
Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all your heart, with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that, he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. We'll pick up. The reading again at verse 38, and in his teaching he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. So far, our reading from God's Word. Let us now also read from the Confession of Faith that we find in Lord's Day 42 regarding the 8th commandment, the eighth commandment simply is this, you shall not steal. Lord say 42 unpacks the meaning of that commandment. So God's will for us in the eighth commandment we can read of in Lord say 42 with these words as the church confesses them. What does God forbid in the Eighth Commandment? God forbids not only outright theft and robbery, but also such wicked schemes and devices as false weights and measures, deceptive merchandising, counterfeit money, and usury. We must not defraud our neighbor in any way, whether by force or by show of right. In addition, God forbids all greed and all abuse or squandering of his gifts. What does God require of you in this commandment? I must promote my neighbor's good wherever I can and may. Deal with him as I would like others to deal with me. And work faithfully so that I may be able to give to those in need. So far, the reading of the church's confession. After the proclamation of God's word, let us respond by singing from Psalm 24, stanzas 1, 2, and 3. Psalm 24, 1, 2, and 3, following the sermon. Brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, when we look at the catechism's treatment of the Eighth Commandment, Again, we see that familiar pattern. First of all, stating what God forbids in the commandment. This includes whatever may defraud our neighbor, whatever would harm him, whatever would rob him of what is rightly his. What is forbidden is theft and also any fraudulent practice in, in our business affairs but also charging excessive interest, that's usury, and the like. 
even down to greed. We are to love our neighbors, and that means that we are to seek to do whatever advantages our neighbor and not what disadvantages him or harms him or hurts him. We have the positive expression of this commandment stated as well in question and answer 111. It's very simple that I do whatever I can for my neighbor's good and deal with him as I would have others with me. Well, that's the golden rule. Do unto others what you would have them do to you. And so if you want to be treated fairly, and if you want to be given an honest day's pay, make sure that you treat others fairly and pay them what they are due in that regard. The Catechism also says that I work faithfully so that I am able to give to those in need. The Eighth Commandment also goes there. We understand that we are called to share from the abundance of what God has given us with those in need. And you can see how far this goes. It's not simply, it, it's not enough simply to refrain from stealing and robbing and scheming people out of their money through crooked behavior, by falsifying your accounts, by cutting corners by depriving people of their proper due, no, it's also that we work honestly and that if the Lord blesses you richly, you are to contribute from your excess to share with others. That's the goal ultimately, that out of the possessions and profit that God has given to us, we are to bless others. It's even there in the marriage form. The marriage form that we read at a, a wedding each time for all of us who are married or were married or attended a wedding. We've heard the words of this form read and you've heard then the, the calling and the duty that's given specifically to the husband not only to treat his wife honorably and sacrifice himself for her but also this, these words Work faithfully in your daily calling that you may support your family, it's a no-brainer, and also help those in need. That's one purpose of marriage, to be a blessing and to bring extended benefits to society and to the larger surrounding community. And so the Eighth Commandment is calling us to that same way of life. The Eighth Commandment applies directly to our use and our disposal of God's gifts. And it's significant, I think, that the Catechism uses the words abuse or squandering in question and answer 110 at the end to describe the depth of what is forbidden here. For those words indicate, don't they, that our money and our resources and our wealth and our income is not ours first and foremost, but it has a, a purpose beyond our own needs. If they were there only for us to spend however we see fit, then you could not talk of abuse or squandering, could you? But then you see that we must use our money and our resources in a way that, that God decides, that God sees fit. And then that changes everything. That puts everything in its proper order, reminding us that all belongs to God and must be devoted to Him. And so this afternoon we'll consider the Eighth Commandment in connection with the Scripture passage we read earlier from Mark 12. There we were drawn to the, the stark contrast that we see there between the rich, dignified people who, out of their wealth, expose their poverty, in contrast to the poor, insignificant widow who gave out of her poverty, revealing her great wealth. And she is the one who receives our Master's commendation. So we'll look at this further under the following theme. In the Eighth Commandment, God calls us to honor Him with the gifts and wealth He has given us. We'll see first a strong warning, and secondly, a surprising commendation. First, we see the strong warning 
in Mark chapter 12 to set out the context of, of this chapter, Jesus is stirring up controversy from one conversation to the next. He's stepping on toes, you might say. In one instance, he goes up against the Sadducees who denied the resurrection. They were the first century theological liberals. They were the educated, the sophisticated, and they said, we don't understand how a resurrection could be possible, but Jesus exposes them for their, their emptiness and their lack of faith, of the truth of the resurrection. He reminds them of such. And Jesus also confronts the Pharisees after them, who were the first century conservatives, who were rigid about the law, who, who knew backward and forward every jot and tittle of the law, even going so far as to tie their garden spices. They were revered, they were highly respected among the people of the day throughout Israel. But Jesus tells them that they failed to understand what grace was all about for all of their learning, for all of their ability to quote the scriptures, they did not understand that underneath all of scripture was a message of grace. Salvation by grace and not by works. So he tells them, he tells the Pharisees that they were saddling God's people under heavy burdens and leading people astray through their ministry. And then in verse 38, Christ moves on to expose the scribe. And this is what we will focus on in, in, mo in the most detail uh, this afternoon. In exposing the scribe, Christ also teaches us how to treat the gifts that God has given to us. But we can put it this way, that the underlying question this passage presents to us and confronts us with is this. What does the use of your gifts, particularly your money, say about you? What does it say ultimately about your heart? Christ said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts. Now, what do all of those things have in common, boys and girls? It shows that they want to be noticed. They want recognition. They want applause. They want people to see them and respect them and esteem them as men of, of great learning and great godliness. As they, and they perform their religious duties with great flair, not with a view towards pleasing God and honoring God, but with a view towards receiving the applause of men. And elsewhere, Jesus said that when people act this way and they pray their showy and their lengthy prayers and, and do that simply so that other people will hear them, then they've already got their reward. They've got all the reward they're going to get. But God will not hear them, and God will not reward them. But it gets worse than that. These scribes are described as people who devour widows' houses. Why does Jesus say widow? And why does he point to the widow in, in, the, in the following episode in particular? which we read at, at the tail end of Mark 12. Well, because a widow was the most vulnerable person in that society, where there was no social security net, no government assistance, no welfare program, a widow was at the mercy of her family. And if, in fact, she had no family, she was at the mercy of the people of God to look after her. In fact, time and time again, the Old Testament scriptures say that God identifies with the poor, with the widow, 
with the orphan, those who are most vulnerable and most in need of care. Now what do these men of great renown and great esteem and great learning do to these widows? They devour their houses, meaning they exploit them by their sham religiosity. And they seek to fill their own pockets. And for a pretense, they make long prayers, Christ says. In saying that, it's not that Christ was saying that long prayers are to be rejected. No, it's not the length that Jesus is critiquing and rejecting. It's the fabrication, the fakeness of it. Doing it for the applause and honor and accolades of the people. Doing it for one's own personal benefit. And listen to what Jesus says here. He saves his most vicious rebuke, not for those who are devoid of understanding, like the Gentile who has never heard of the message of salvation. He reserves his strongest words and harshest judgment for those within the covenant, the religious frauds. And in this case, for the conservative fraud, saying they will receive the greater condemnation, greater than the Gentiles who don't know God. And so let us take warning from that, that man judges by looking at the outside, but God judges the heart. So that's the first thing that Christ draws our attention to, Sham religion. He condemns it. He condemns religion that's practiced simply for the sake of, of the approval and the applause of men. He doesn't want that kind of religion. He doesn't want sacrifices just for the sake of sacrifices, offerings for the sake of offerings. But then Jesus follows up this condemnation with a story of the kind of life and the kind of system and earns his commendation that brings us to our second point. What we have here in Mark 12 verses 41 to 44 is a story that we would do well to, do, to focus upon in light of the Eighth Commandment. What does it mean when God commands us, do not steal? It means, as I said, more than just do not defraud your neighbor. Con him or her. It means more than simply work hard. It means that above all, understand that all that you have is a gift from God and God requires from you all that we have been given. Verse 41 reads, and, and he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. So Jesus was at the temple. And at the temple there were a number of collection boxes spread out over the, the temple uh, uh, compound. Jesus is sitting there from, from a vantage point where he could see people come in and bring their offerings and put them in the collection. And it was the practice in that day for people to come to church with their coins and they would drop them in one after the other so that there would be a clink, clink, clink noise that everyone could hear what was being given. And you can well imagine the scenario that Jesus is observing at a distance. He sees what's going on. There are these people who come in strutting, wearing their, sun, their Sabbath best, their long robes. And they're drawing the attention of the crowds and they, they come in with a, a big and heavy sack of coins and they don't just hand that sack over to a priest or to some other official at the temple in an inconspicuous way, but they take coin after coin after coin, and you can imagine the sound 
of coin after coin falling into the treasury. You can imagine the attention that this would bring for, for someone who is bringing in a large sum of money. You can imagine the attention that would come their way. The onlookers would see and be awestruck and amazed. Look at how generous they are. And perhaps some would even applaud such, such fine and exemplary behavior and conduct. And maybe some would suggest that they would have their names etched on the, on the bricks of the temple or published in the newspaper. Maybe they could even name a wing of the temple after him. He's so generous. Certainly, God must be pleased with such generosity. But over against the widow, uh, the, sorry, over against the wealthy who trumpet their giving, the text says that a poor widow came and put in two copper coins which make a penny. So you have the, the many who are giving these sky-high amounts and enormous sums of money, and then you have this widow quietly doing her thing. Well, can you imagine how you would have responded to seeing all of this if you were there? The temptation would be to be so impressed by these vast sums going into the coffers. But as Jesus is watching, he looks deeper. He sees this widow. She has no big bag of, of coins. She has just two copper coins which you could easily carry around in one palm, one hand. And these two copper coins are called lepta in the Greek. They were shavings. They were so wafer thin that you could you could hardly hold them in your hands. You wouldn't know that they were there. They're so light. They're so brittle. So insignificant. They were the equivalent of one sixty-fourth of a day's wage. Less than a penny. That's all that she has. Just two copper coins. And she comes up to the collection box and all you could hear is a faint and soft clink, clink. No doubt, the people who were observing this paid no attention to this whatsoever. In fact, some of them may have been embarrassed by that for the very fact that she comes with only two coins, which, which were her only two coins, is, is that this is an indictment against the people of Jesus' own day. She was so poor not being provided for as she ought to have been, that two coins was all that she had. When she should have been in a society where widows and orphans were well looked after, well provided for, and had no need, as the church is called to do. She had nothing. Her livelihood was minimal. She was scraping the bottom of the barrel to make ends meet every day. And Jesus sees this as he's watching and he calls his disciples over and he says to them, come here, watch this. Did you see what she did? And the disciples probably didn't notice anything. They only saw an old lady drop a couple of coins in the coffer. Big deal. So what? How could you compare that to the, the vast truckloads of, of wealth that's coming in and being donated by the wealthy. But Jesus says to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all who are contributing to the, office, the offering box. And, we think, and I think you can all imagine the disciples' jaws dropping to the floor. You must be out of your mind, Jesus. What do you mean? Then comes the explanation. They all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in all she had. The point Jesus was making here was, was this. You should not be impressed by the rich people who come to the temple with their large bag of gold and silver coins. 
They came to the temple having an abundance. It cost them relatively little to give those vast sums of money. But what should impress and what should convict you to your very heart is this very poor widow who in giving these two little coins gave her last coins she owned and had to live on. Jesus puts it this way, she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. That's the ESV's translation of the original. Literally, the Greek says the widow gave out of her life. That's the point. She gave out of her life. Our calling in the Eighth Commandment God wants us to be doing more than just our duty. He wants us to give more than just the bare minimum required, such as on the bottom line of, of the annual budget, which is not an assessment, but an average breakdown per communicant member to meet the church budget. The Lord does not want a magical number he wants us to give as we are able to give. He, if, if He has blessed you to give more, then give more. If He has blessed you with less, then surely you still have something to give. This widow, she did not have much, and yet she still had something to give. The point Jesus wants to teach His disciples and all of us is that He wants everything from us. He wants everything for a couple of reasons. Because following after Him is not a half-hearted commitment. Following Him is not for the faint of heart. It is not for those who want to plow the field, Christ says, but keep on turning back to look at what is behind them. It's for people who are totally, completely committed, even to the point where it costs them, perhaps costing them everything. That's why on one occasion when the disciples come to Jesus and say that they have left behind everything for His sake in order to follow Him, their homes, their families, and they wonder what's in it for them. Jesus tells them that there is great reward, not the reward in the sense of what the world may see, but by, but by being part of the kingdom of heaven, being part of the, the new world that Jesus is ushering in, that is something more precious than any form of compensation that you can receive. So what our Lord Jesus wants from us then is not the bare minimum. He doesn't want half-hearted disciples. He wants us to be challenged, to give as the Lord gives increase and blessing. He wants us to give out of the thankfulness of our hearts, not out of mere duty or compulsion. But also Jesus wants us to know the nature of His own ministry. The widow here is commended because she gave her very life. And it's as if Jesus saw that that resembles himself. He was, as he was making his way to the cross at this time, in Mark chapter 12, what she did was similar to what he would do. He would not withhold his riches for the sake of the poor, but he would give up his riches so that the poor could be made rich in him. He's pointing his disciples to the way of the cross. We give because that is the way of the cross of Calvary. We sacrifice. We lay down our lives and our livelihood. And so by way of a conclusion, what are we to learn from this? Well, when it comes to giving, the posture of our hearts makes all the difference. Indeed, God weighs your motivations. You see, the 
CRA, the Canadian Revenue Agency, doesn't care about how, how angry or how bitter or how upset or resentful you may be when you pay your taxes. The Lord is so different. He wants your heart. He wants a cheerful giver. Think of the words of Paul in that famous chapter on love in 1 Corinthians 13. If I give away all I have and deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. What, what good does it do for you to give vast sums of money and yet have a heart that is bitter, a heart that's resentful, a heart that's greedy, a heart that's stingy. You will gain nothing. So pray, first of all, that God will give you a heart that is in the right place. But another thing we learn here is that giving which pleases God is giving that is costly. It's costly. Some of you, I'm sure, know what it's like to, to, to know the, the blessing that comes when giving has costed you dearly. Just think of uh, the previous generations, the older generations among us who, who gave up many things for the sake of establishing new churches and new schools, sending covenant children to, to Christian schools, they would forego the, the nice house. They would forego the newer car and the nice vacations and the fancy furnishings in their home. Why? Because there was something of greater importance. There was commitment to make costly sacrifices for the sake of God's kingdom. Do we still make costly sacrifices for the sake of God's kingdom in the same way or similar ways. And therefore, something you and I should think about further this day is when was the last time that giving costed you dearly? I think of how uh, when I was younger, when the collection bag would come around on, on Sunday, snaking through the pews, how strong the temptation was and what a strong temptation it was for a person making minimum wage or maybe less to, to simply scrape together and pull out the, the smallest coins you could find, the nickels and dimes and pennies out of your wallet, out of your purse and, and toss them in when there were fives, tens, twenties also available. But when, su when such a temptation enters your mind, whether it's while you're sitting in the pew or whether it's when you're crunching the numbers on your taxes or when you're deciding how much you have to donate to a good cause or contribute to the church budget on a monthly basis, remember that to give something that costs you nothing is to cheapen the sacrifice. It cheapens it. To never feel like your giving is, is causing a dent in your finances and never creating even the least bit of a pinch is not to be giving as God wants your giving to be. And understand also this lesson that God can do great things with small offerings. We see that in this passage. The widow is commended not because she gave a, a significant or sizable offering. No, just two pennies. That's nothing. But what the church needs are not larger offerings or more offerings, but offerings that come from the heart. So offerings are more than just plain offerings. Offerings reveal what lives in your heart and mine. And therefore, money matters are so much bigger than just dollars and cents. Such a much bigger matter. In fact, money matters, matters of giving and sharing, will be brought into consideration in terms of God's final reckoning, the final judgment. We see that in Mark 12. For 
Jesus says to, about the scribes, about those who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. But regarding the widow, it's entirely possible that she may never have known in her entire life that Jesus commended her for her, her meager gift on that day. She may never have known that this event was recorded in the Bible for us, for people like us, 2,000 years later to read about and to see how she is honored for her generosity, even if it is so little. And so we see that God is not more favorable to one person or the other. There is no advantage to being rich. There is no advantage to being poor. God does not care if you have deep pockets or if you have nothing in your pockets. He cares more about your heart than about your pockets. He cares more about if you give and how you give as in the spirit of your giving rather than what you give or how much you give. Money talks, as the saying goes. Money talks. That's true. So true. For some, it is the only voice they hear. For some, it is the only language they speak. But the question for all of us, brothers and sisters, is this. If money talks, what does yours say about you? Amen.
well as your word of encouragement would sink deep into our hearts this afternoon. Lord, we have seen in your word a beautiful depiction of the cross and of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ through the widow's gift. Father, there are those among us, perhaps many, perhaps all of us, who are reluctant and hesitant and maybe even fearful to give like she gave. Not because we're stingy or greedy, but because we do not always trust in your power to provide for us, supply our every need, and to bless our giving. So, Father, free us from the fear that enslaves us, the fear that robs us of the joy of knowing your blessing. Teach us, Lord, to give in ways that are costly, in ways that reflect true faith and love and devotion to you. Teach us, Lord, what it means to give out of our very life, just as the widow did, just as Christ Jesus did for us. And Lord, this afternoon we bring our prayer and our supplications to you, also on behalf of our nation, on behalf of its leaders, we pray that you will give them all wisdom and strength to do their tasks, to do so faithfully and diligently and uprightly, so that justice and peace may be preserved, so that your church may continue to have the freedom to worship you and to carry out her calling in this world. And Father, also when our leaders <coughs> disappoint us and when laws are passed, Against your will that threaten to undermine our Christian freedoms. We pray that such laws may be thwarted, that they may be overturned, if it be your will. That, that we also, if it not be your will, may have the courage to be faithful to you in spite of them. Father, help us to respect and honor the authorities you set in place over us, to treat them according to the dignity of their office, and above all, help us to remember them and their work regular, regularly before you in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we could have on this Lord's Day to gather for worship twice in peace and freedom, without fear, without threat, interruption. Father, we thank you for this blessing, and we pray that you will preserve this freedom in this country, and preserve all of our Christian freedoms, that your church may continue to do her work unhindered, so that the gospel message may go out into this world, to all nations, to all peoples, and tribes, and, and languages. Father, we pray for all your ambassadors who are engaged in that work, who labor in the cause of your kingdom. May they do it faithfully and diligently, whether it is the work that is done by those called to the special offices of your church, of minister, elder, and deacon, also those that task here among us, or if it be in the works of love and service done by any of your people in the office of believer. Father, we pray that you will bless every effort. Lord, may it be for the strengthening of your church, for the body of Christ, for the bride who is being prepared for the wedding with the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, when he returns on the clouds of heaven and ushers in the new and perfect age when all that is wrong will be made right, when every small act of service may be seen for its great importance, and when all that is perishable will be made imperishable, and we will be with you forever. Father, speed that day forward, that it may come soon, that we may all be ready, that we may be filled with eager longing and anticipation for that day to come when it arrives. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen. The Lord now gives you opportunity to bring your offerings of thankfulness to Him. And after the offering has been collected, let us sing our closing song from hymn 17, the song of Mary, stanzas 1, 2, 5, and 6.
receive now the blessing of the Lord and go your ways in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.